So um, what we're going to do, is, I, I've outlined this in the um, in the in the emails to everybody in the description of this is that we're assuming that everybody is new to social media and to to working with the media as well. So we've kept it, we, we've gone right back to basics. So kind of apologies in advance if you know most of this stuff, but we we really have gone back to, to square one so that people who have lots of questions can ask them. Um, and what we thought we would do is keep the deck quite short, actually quite, quite specific and concentrate on just two areas because obviously communications is really big. Um, we're asked, we, you know, we're tasked to do an awful lot of uh, elements within uh, communications remit. So we've just focusing on social media and then what we call traditional media as well. And we'll go into what that kind of covers later on. Um, so we'll also just focus on on a press writing press releases a little bit and then what we said was that if you wanted to ask uh, questions if you can put those into the chat function or email or or direct them directly to shona there shona gibson she's in blue with glasses she's waving um so we will will she can ask me the questions as we go through so we keep it more of a conversation as we as we go through okay so with social uh and and digital media one of the very first things that you need to do is sit back and ask yourself what on earth it is you're being tasked to do and how you are going to do this in terms of what your you know are you going to be starting from scratch so you're a class you're say the 1720s or the sp20s do you already have existing social media channels does your class have a website like what what is at your what are, what's at your fingertips first and then you can work back from there and ask yourself the next question, which is who on earth are you trying to talk to? And that is probably your biggest question. Who exactly is your audience? Are you trying to grow the class? Are you trying to uh, attract participants into this particular event? Or are you trying to create impact for sponsors? And the answer to that, the audience question will dictate uh, the channel that you use. Because it's really important to remember that with social media, all these different channels that we, we talk about in this page, they are all what we call mouths to feed. You know, they take up a huge amount of time because you've got to create messages that you can then tailor to each different channel because each channel is different. Um, and you've got to, you know, edit that content and you've got to post that content and it takes an awful lot of time. So knowing who you're speaking to from the outset is a really important question to ask yourself because then you can simplify this particular list. Now, obviously, we use all these channels, so we can talk um, about each of these channels, which we'll do quickly now. Um, but you probably won't need to do that because you know this is your 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 volunteers. You know, you don't have time to do this or the appetite to do this. Um, and I, I just wanted to give you a couple of examples of what has worked very well for us and why it's worked well for us. So for example, with LinkedIn, that has worked very well for us when we talk to sponsors because LinkedIn creates this peer-to-peer -peer community. Um, and so for example, on the recent Youth Nationals, we had a sponsor who uh, we did a lot of posts with on LinkedIn and that kind of created traction for them because they're all about attracting a business network in. Or, uh, conversely, say in the summer months, we find that TikTok works really well with a much younger cohort of sailors. They're all around in the summer. They love seeing posts and pictures of themselves. So you get a real kind of buzz and, con and conversation going on there. Um, and then, you know, another example would be the reels that we use on Instagram. Again, they, you know, people really love seeing competitors love seeing each other up on, on, on reels and you get these, the, 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 content that performs particularly well on Instagram Reels are these kind of behind the scenes looks where uh, we get access to uh, the athletes and they do uh, interviews with us. Um, so that works very well. But what I'm trying to say is that each of these different um, channels, each has a very distinct audience and you've got to be very mindful that you've got to tailor those messages per channel. So I will go very quickly through these particular channels and we'll talk about them a little bit. That might be able to give you uh, more information about how you would target your particular audience for your for your event. Um, the other thing that I would also say is it is a very 
movable feast, the, the social media channels. We find that the algorithms change, that sometimes things that have worked don't work anymore. We're constantly having to take stock as to what works and what doesn't. Um, so, you know, don't be dismayed if you don't see your followers growing, for example. It may be that your engagement is very good. Um, and that you have a really good conversation growing. It's better to have a small but very engaged audience than something that's very big and you're not really making traction with, um, with your followers. Um, the other thing that I would say as well is unless you are going to throw vast amounts of money at this, uh, it's it's a pay for play um, uh pool and none of us have that kind of money so organic reach organic growth is where it's at and that tends to be very sm very small so set your you know be realistic about your your expectations so with facebook um unsurprisingly i know people you know really don't like it but it is still the very biggest mass reach channel of all the social media channels it hits 78 percent of irish people so in other words 78 percent of irish people have an account there it's obviously the best um channel for families and it has it definitely has an older demographic audience than say instagram has it's less newsy than twitter so you don't have to feed it as much um, you can also do things like link your Facebook and your Instagram channels so that they're sending out the same kind of posts so you can you can save time that way. Um, we find that video consistently works better on Facebook than than photographs does do. And then our most active uh, group on Facebook for our sailing is a 45, 54 year old group. And we have a 60, 40 male female split that's reversed on Instagram. So it, it tells you that, you know, not your content is, is going to probably have to be tweaked, even though I said that you can, you can uh, channel, you can use Facebook and Instagram uh, content, you sometimes have to tweak that. So Instagram is Irish Sailing's fastest social media channel. It is uh, key to targeting younger demographics. Um, we know that 68% of Irish 15 to 18 year olds have an Instagram account. And certainly for us, for Irish Sailing, our biggest uh, demographic here is the 18 to 34 age group. But as I said, we have the opposite split, 60, 40 female, male. But Instagram is an incredibly visual channel. You do not want to be putting up really content, uh, text heavy uh, imagery up there. It has to be beautiful photographs and, and video. So keep it very text light. Um, and Instagram has made things very complicated in that they have posts, which are the little squares, they have reels, which are the videos, and they have stories, which is the, the bar across the top. So you, even though you may have one Instagram post, you may have three versions of that, unfortunately. Um, as I said, they're, they're, they're mouths to feed. And we can, we can answer questions on that a little bit later if you like, but we find that reels and stories do very well. Posts uh, have less uh, traction, but it's a posts are really good places for you to leave information so that people can refer back to it once the story has gone. Um, Twitter, as we know, is uh, has been going through a lot of changes recently. Most recent is that the blue tick that they you now have to pay for. It's very useful though in terms of news. Um, Ninety two percent of Irish journalists use it every single day, so it's a great place to update results and have that kind of immediate timed uh, news releases. Very short, snappy, snappy things. But again, photographs and videos are working very well on, on Twitter nowadays. And what we find is you can't really um, target demographic groups on Twitter, but you can target uh, insight, uh, interest groups rather. Um, and the other thing that we have learned as well is, you, you know, avoid debates on Twitter. It is full of trolls and it can get very nasty very quickly. So avoid it. Um, it's just not worth your not worth your while. Um, TikTok is something that we started about a year ago and we've had uh, varied success. It started off really well. And probably if you set up a TikTok channel, you will see that it, it goes very quickly, very successful, and then it tapers off because they want you to spend money on it. Um, it's a much younger channel than any of the, of the other channels. We know that um, uh, from, you know, the media, but we don't have it in stats because TikTok doesn't uh, track anybody that's younger than 18. Um, but we have noticed that there has been a shift recently. Joan and I were talking about this earlier on today to say uh, that we're seeing that people are moving away from TikTok back onto Instagram Reels. So if you had a choice between doing TikTok and Instagram, I would say just stick with Instagram and forget TikTok. Um, unless you're 
targeting really, really uh, a much younger, a much younger group. Um, then LinkedIn, obviously, we've touched on in terms of uh, the business community and this kind of peer to peer networking. Um, it is very useful when it comes to sponsorship. It's very useful if you are to set up, say, a page for your class or your club, which then you yourself then can reshare or repost and, and tap into your network. Because what we find with LinkedIn is that people really like to hear from other people and not pages and not uh, companies. It works best when it's a peer-to-peer -peer flow of information. Um, and then YouTube, we use as almost like a library of videos. They're really used. It's a really useful place to have um, uh, to have videos that we can then link back from either a class uh, page or a club page, um, or even on your on your Instagram posts. You can uh, we'll, we'll touch that uh, touch on that in a minute when it goes through LinkedIn. But you can you can bring everybody back either to a website or back to a YouTube page. And then finally, I think we should mention the fact that when you're at your event, those WhatsApp and Telegram and Facebook. Uh, Facebook groups are really important to give all your um, competitors and participants real-time information. Um, you know, you can't rely on the Instagram or the Facebook channel to pump out that kind of minute-by-minute uh, -minute information because people will just switch off. They're, they're not interested in that kind of um, very detailed information. WhatsApp, Telegram, they're the places that you do that, uh, that kind of uh, information exchange. And then one thing that has we've really seen a resurgence in popularity on is the is the newsletter. So they went out of fashion, and now since uh, since GDPR, which seems a while ago now, because everybody had to resubscribe, they had to opt in. The people who get newsletters are genuinely interested in what you have to say. So we actually get a really high click through rate on our own newsletters, and I think I'd imagine if you have one too that that uh, you shouldn't discount it. It's a really useful place to get information out. And then one last thing that I wanted to mention here, and I know it's not social media, it's more of a digital channel, but a website. If you already have a class website, it can be a really useful place to um, use as a library so that you can direct all your information from your social media posts back to your website and you can put everything in one place. It, it acts as like a, yeah, as a library of information. And we talk later on about call to actions on all your social media posts and your website can be the place um, that everything lies. So don't discount it if you're thinking about these social media channels. So um, things that we have learned, Sean and I, over the over the years, uh, we thought it might be useful to learn from our mistakes. Um, things that you may already have that you don't even know you have. So you've been given access to your Facebook page or to your Instagram account. There are already analytics on there that you can use. And what I mean by analytics are the insights into the audience that you're trying to get to. Who are the people that you're trying to get to? And are they already existing? Is that the biggest group in your, in your Instagram page, for example? It'll give you demographics. It'll give you geographic location. Um, and it will also give you what the most popular posts were in the past, not for a long time, it goes back to about 90 days, but it should, you should be able to see, okay, right, well, that worked really well. They really liked a picture of me and my yacht, and my dog. So let's try that again and see if that works. Or conversely, they may hate the fact that you posted a really boring piece of um, text heavy information and nobody's really, nobody's really looking at that. So you'll be able to see what's worked in the past and who it's working with, which is really useful when you go in there blind. Um, it'll also give you information about when the most popular posting times are. Now, obviously, some of this is common sense. You know, you don't post, you know, probably first thing on a Monday morning because nobody's looking at their phones, really. But Friday afternoon or Saturday morning will often be really good times where you can put uh, content out. And to make your life easier, there are plenty of scheduling um, uh, apps or or channels now or um, uh, what's the word? Um, companies that do can do this for you. So we use Meta Business Suite, which over obviously owns Instagram and Facebook now. Um, but there's also a company called Hoot Suite, which is H-O-O-T Suite, S-U-I-T-E. And they will, you will be able to put your content in there and all your text and everything that you want to say, and they will schedule it for you so that you can do everything on a Monday night and you can have things going out on a Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and they will do all that for you. And they're all free, which is great. Um, 
one of the things that we have spoken about or mentioned is this call to action. All your social media stuff, all your social media content should have this call to action. What is it that you are trying to get people to do? Are you asking them to register? Are you asking them to pay? Are you asking them to get involved, to volunteer? You know, everything has to have this call to action. And if you can bring that back to your class website or your class page, then you're creating this kind of um, virtuous circle of conversation and interest and information flow. And one of the ways that we do it in our sailing is by using this uh, company called Linktree. And you'll often see in on an Instagram post, it will have call um, link in the bio or go to our profile. And underneath that, you'll have this Linktree website uh, address and you click on that and it'll give you a set of more links that then will give you um, channels to say, for example, the most interesting are the runners and riders who are going to be at your event or how to register or where to uh, volunteer. And so you can have all those all those different links within that Linktree event. And it means that everybody, again, is being directed via Linktree onto your website or wherever you decide to store your information. Um, and with that call to action and with whatever app you use to direct your flow of information, make sure that you have your facts right and your links are easy to use. There's nothing more frustrating than clicking on a link on an Instagram post or a Facebook post and there's nowhere to go. You don't know how you find out more information. Um, and so Shona is now going to tell you a little bit about the visuals of, of some of these posts and what has worked well for us in the past. Yeah, so the visuals are like a really important thing to all of your um, to all of your posts on all of your channels, especially. So you'd think it's just Instagram, but um, we tag an image to everything on Twitter and Facebook because it's a it's a draws the eye in when people are scrolling, and a text heavy post on Facebook and Twitter. Sometimes people can just keep going past it, whereas if there's an image to draw them in, then they're more likely to look at your post. And then again don't have all the information on the image. So we've got two examples here. Uh, the image on the left, I would say, from my opinion, is just too text heavy. And you don't really, you kind of see it and you're not really sure what's going on. And you kind of have to lean in and squint to see that this is an Ilka class sailor and he's giving a talk. And so you might just scroll past that because you don't really, you're not interested by it. But if it's a picture of him in his laser and then it just says, live q a friday seven like on friday at seven you're more likely to go oh cool and then you lean in further to read the information whereas just looking at it like that you might scroll past so then the image on the right is um more of an example of like it's more visually aesthetic and pleasing and it's more likely to draw you in because it just has the image it has who their sponsors are and it tells you when when and where and you're like okay cool that's that's easy enough and it has the image of because this one in particular is a virtual reg regatta so it's it's a laptop whereas it, for sailing it, it would be a boat it would be whatever class you guys are and don't use a picture of your class say like a mirror way in the distance and you're not exactly able to tell if it's a squib or a mirror use up close images that are high definition that um kind of give give more of an exciting feel to the sport, to the, to your class, to what you're trying to sell, especially if it's a youth event, smiling faces. Um, if you are lucky enough in your club to have an ambassador of your club who's succeeded over time, it's great to use them um, to draw people in because people see it. If you can see it, you can be it. They kind of go, oh yeah, I'd, I'd love to do that. Or it's just these small anchors our quick, simple ways to get people to stop when they're scrolling and click into what you're trying to sell or what you're trying to promote. Um, so that all comes down to keeping it simple. And then also on top of that, keeping it consistent. So one post every two weeks isn't going to do it because of the way the algorithms work on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Um, Facebook, however, might actually stay in people's feed because if the people that they are connected with are all connecting with the mirror worlds and Sligo Yacht Club, they're it's going to come up on their feed. It's going to stay at the top of their feed. Whereas with Instagram, 
you have to be consistent. You have to be posting once every other day, once a day, twice a day to get your event to be seen, to be up there. And don't be posting the same thing, be posting different kinds of images. And um, you can use on Instagram, you have the ability to flick. So you can have more than one image. The first one, make it a picture of the sport, a really great picture of the sport. And then the next slide can be the information about the event. Um, so you're still keeping the information there and it's not all in the tiny text at the bottom, but the image that draws you in is um, the first one and make sure it's a good image because if it's a bad picture, people just might be interested or if you're not using good imagery, you're not selling it to the best of its ability. You're not selling it as a professional event or as what you want it to be seen as. So that then all comes back to creating the community um, and you can use a content calendar timeline. You can use this within the apps that Teresa mentioned, Meta Business Suite and Hootsuite to, you can plan ahead or you can just keep it in a diary of your own um, so that you have a time. Yeah. And it certainly saves you time when you're thinking about it um, yeah. up front. You can put everything into your content calendar so you know exactly what you're doing on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. It just saves you time when you're when you're thinking about this. Yeah. And the final point, I think, on on tips, we were we were talking about this earlier on today, and Shana was laughing at me because I said I was talking about digital natives, which she is, and I am definitely not. And so things that would take me half a day to do takes Shona 10 minutes. Um, so you know, if you have uh, a TY student, uh, you know, a teenager who who has this time on their hands, particularly coming into the summer, rope them in because they will be, you know, Shona is um, far more on top of what is cool, what is on trend, what the latest TikTok memes and songs are than I ever will be. So, you know, if you have that kind of um, access to somebody who's on on TikTok on their phone all the time use it and see if they're they're able to help you with it as i said it'll take you half the time and they'll be much uh, they'll be they'll be on it in the way that maybe you know i'm not i'm definitely not <laughs> so um we may stop there and uh just just a, a quick recap then on on social media choose your audience make sure that you know exactly who it is that you're targeting that will dictate who your what your channel is and then match your message to that particular channel using those facts that we talked about earlier. So if we stop there, are there any questions on social media before we go into um, talking to journalists? I've got one question. Ooh. I've got one question I can um, go for here. Sure. Yeah. So um, we've kind of kind of covered it already, but just things that make an Instagram post successful. What are things that make an Instagram post successful? And we have kind of used it all already, but just to say it again, it's um, using people's faces, not blobs. So not a boat really far in the distance. Um, people up close like an up close shot of the boat or of what's going on to to make it more personal to the person receiving the information moving imagery so videos the way the instagram algorithm is going videos are really really um the best way to get things coming in at the moment and i've seen last summer a lot of clubs kind of taking videos of their um summer courses kind of on fridays or something and they were really cool fun videos but those things are great because it's also anyone who's scrolling through will come across it and will be like, it looks like fun. This is great. And they want to engage. They then want to send their kids to engage. So um, they're all really good things. And there was one. Um, can I add in uh, two things there? One is that um, I think it's really important to flag at this point that you need to get permissions for people to, uh, particularly young people, when you're using posts on social media. So the way that we do that is on all our registrations, we have a waiver line. Um, so people um, opt out, opt in into um, photographs. I, we've never had an instance yet where people haven't wanted to share their photograph, but it's really it's really important that they're aware that you're gonna be doing that. And then the other thing I th think that, uh, to flag as well is that, 
the, and I, I see this all the time is this, the stuff that we take for granted within our sport, you know, it is really exciting and interesting to people who aren't sailing, who aren't sailors. You know, we have great imagery of really exciting and beautiful um, scenery. And that looks amazing when we're doing social media. You know, we're not trying to flog something that's really um, looks quite dull. Like it looks amazing and people look happy. And so, you know, we kind of take it for granted, but I think we have a real advantage when it comes to that. Yeah. So um, if there are no... A comment had come in there, just um, someone, uh, Rachel had said she's a recommendation for a site. And she said, Canva is a great tool for making posters for Instagram, Facebook, etc. It's free to use and she would highly recommend it. So yeah, absolutely. We awesome. use it. Yeah, we use it ourselves. Canva, it's, uh, yeah, it's great. And so basically what you can do is you can take an image, you can take a photograph, and then you can put your club or your class logo on top of it. So all your stuff is branded. It looks great. Okay, cool. Let's move on then. Um, if I can. Oh, that's funny. There we go. Right. Okay. So talking to journalists. Um, so obviously the importance of talking to the media, we have a, a kind of a, a triple effect. We, we build re relationships with the media. It's really important when it comes to um, PR and promotion. It raises the profile of our sports and what it is that we do. And then that has a knock on effect, obviously, for sponsorship and bringing, sorry, not sponsorship, for support and participation, bringing people into our sports. And then that again has a knock on effect when it comes to funding and sponsorship. You're far more likely to give support or uh, money to a sport that you've heard about, people that you've heard about. So it, it's um, one of those things that we, you know, it's, it's a really important element of, of communications. So although uh, we talk about the, the term traditional media in this presentation, we're talking about, you know, press, radio, TV, print, most of those media channels also have online channels as well. So the two digital and traditional are very much uh, enmeshed now. And I think it's really important to flag up the, um, the weight of uh, regional media. Um, you know, all the local media stations or radio stations and local newspapers, they have really big audiences in this country and they can be very, very supportive of what we do. And it's really great to get when you get them on side. Like I'm thinking about, you know, Red FM and Cork or the Limerick Leader, the Carler Nationalists were up, they support Finn. There are big fans of Finn Lynch, uh, Wicklow People, you know, they are they are really big, important pieces of, of the, the, the press, the, the national media landscape. Um, and actually, it's it's surprisingly um, easy to get a relationship going with them. And the way that you start building up a, a relationship with a journalist, if you haven't already got a network uh, in there already, is by creating a hook. And I, I say this because it's it's important to understand the media landscape now. It has changed immeasurably in the last uh, ten years, as we know. You know, everybody's moving to to digital subscriptions. When you work with journalists, it's important to understand that we it, it helps if we make their life easier. I was talking to um, the editor of the Examiner recently, and he was saying that in the last ten years, he has never had so many stories, sports stories across his desk, and we are really fighting for our share of voice, and so when you think about how much work they have to do as journalists and how thinly they are being stretched, you know, they have to cover three sports and not one. It's really important that we try and make their life as easy as possible. And to do that, we create this hook. We kind of create this story for them so that they can then go, oh, well, look at what sailing's doing. They're doing a really cool thing. And that then gets them the access to the paper or the radio station plot. So, um, one of the things that we have found that has worked really well, and you may have done as well with your events, is that we have invited journalists out. We recently had a media day at the Performance HQ in Dunleary, where we invited, I think if we ended up having 14 of the top journalists in the country. We had RTE, um, you may have seen the 6-1 News where they came down to cover it. We had the Irish Times, Examiner, uh, a lot of the local radio stations, FM 104, you know, a lot of different types of journalists who all came, they met the performance team, but then what we did was we brought them out on a rib afterwards. And so they got to go out on the water. And because we know, you know, sailing is not a spectator sport. So for a lot of them, this was the first time that they'd actually seen sailing up 
close and they came off the water, they were buzzing. And this is the type of thing that you can do at your event. You know, you can ring a journalist and say, right, look, we're having this event. Why don't you come down to the club and, you know, join us on the rib? And it will be it'll be exciting for them because they don't get to do this kind of stuff at all. But it also builds up a relationship, a longer relationship, whereby they then start to see the sailing community as part of the larger communities. Because I think sometimes we suffer from a, um, a little bit of a, a preconceived ideas as to what we are. You know, we have clubs and you have to be members, but actually it's very easy to get that sailing and to have that kind of journalist understand what it is that we are doing and how inclusive we are as a sport is really powerful. So um, invite them down to your event. Um, think about um, photographs. We'll come back to that in a second. When they're down at your event, then think about having a spokesperson. It might be you or it might be the Commodore or the class captain or somebody who will have maybe two or three agreed messages that you will have that they get across to that person. I always say that like, it's great. It's good for me to meet a journalist and, and give them the big picture, but it's actually really good for them to meet an expert because then they really get the nitty gritty of, of a story. And that's where sometimes the, the, the interest is sparked. Um, and when you do have a spokesperson, you can always put a, um, a pre-written quote into your press release uh, that is approved, of course, by the person who said it. And that will give a little bit more meat to the bones when the article goes out in, in that particular press release. The one thing I would say, if you are going to use a spokesperson, if you are going to put a journalist in front of anybody to interview them, it's important for you to know that everything is, nothing is off the record. So, you know, you will be quoted. Um, Interviews, as I said, can be really useful. And the other thing that's really useful are photographs. So it's, I would never rely on a local paper or a, a national paper or any kind of channel to bring their own photographer because, you know, you, you just can't rely on that kind of um, uh, manpower. So it can be very helpful if you employ your own photographer or, or have somebody do this photogra photographs because as Shona says, you know, that's the stuff that gets the internet uh, or the social media attraction pictures of happy people. And it also gets it into the newspaper. Again, it's making their life easier because you're supplying them both with a press release and some really gorgeous photographs as well. Um, and the other thing that I would say as well is once you've done all this, you've sent out your press release, you've had your journalist down, they've come out in the rib, they've seen what a great sport we have. Um, it's really cool to do a follow up and not many people do this. So, for example, your story has gone into the paper. It's You've heard it on the radio. You can then ring that journalist up and go, that was great piece. Fantastic. Thank you so much. We're also doing this next event. Come down. And again, it does two things. It gets some interest in what we're doing. And second of all, it builds this link between the wider community and the sailing community. Um, and the other follow up piece is, OK, so they didn't print your story and they didn't cover it in the radio or they didn't do it on the on on their. They said that they were going to do. You can ring them and say, oh, was there any reason why you didn't? Was there something that we didn't do? Is there something we can do to make it still happen? And we're also having this other event. Please come along. And, you know, you, so you're now building that relationship and they are probably more likely to come down to your next event because they're going to feel bad about the fact that they didn't cover your first one. Um, so. The I'll, I'll now talk about the kind of nitty gritties of press releases. Are there any questions on that particular on that on, on building relationships with journalists? Uh, there's a couple of comments in there. <clears throat> Excuse me, Teresa. Um, yeah. from, from Jill, she said, for people who only run a big event occasionally, are you able to share a media list as there is not always time to build a relationship when just volunteering for one or two events? Um, uh, um, yes, that's a that's a good question. Um, if it's a big event, uh, it's not something that we would share because, unfortunately, because it's oh, they're they're kind of they're actually a proprietary asset. We are are saying own that list, and it's it's not something that we can kind of give out. Having said that, we could talk offline about particular events and how you create. Uh, particular contacts or networks, but the list itself is not something that we can unfortunately share. And it's a GDPR thing. It's an asset thing. It's it's uh, it's why you you know you have to employ PR agencies because they own those particular lists and you can't get access to them. But Jill, if you want to, I will talk to you offline about that. 
And actually, I will come back to other ways that Irish sailing can help at the end of this so that it's not a it's a, you don't have to rely entirely on, on this particular one media list. Any other questions at the moment or that's that's the only the one that was in and um, Shona has put up the list there. There was a request for the digital platforms that are being used on social media and the, the names of the different products that you've mentioned. So she's put a list up there. So that's everything for the moment. Cool. OK, so we will talk then briefly about press releases. Um, as I said, it's it's a good rule of thumb to think about how you can make journalists life easier. If you can provide them with a really good press release, it is uh, much more likely that you'll get something in the lo local press or on radio than uh, something that's hastily written or too long. Um, when I was when I was at McKinsey, we used to use these things called story houses, which helped you frame the message. It helped you build the messages because when you have a well thought through message, it's much much easier to get your uh, to get your story out there because you have reasons why you have thinking behind it. Um, and essentially what a story house is, is a house with a roof, which is your ambition. And it, the house is built with different floors that back that or, or support that roof. And that roof then and the, the, the floors of your house are then backed up or supported by what we call strategic pillars, those support messages um, underneath the, 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 the big foundation pillars at the bottom here. And what that looks like in real life then is, for example, your ambition is to get more sailors joining the class. Your objective is we're going to do this by getting more media coverage, including the social media engagement. How on earth are we going to do that? We're going to be we're going to do that by promoting this particular event. This maybe it's a world. And then what are the support messages? What are the strategic pillars that back up those that roof and those floors? It's what makes you unique. It's the there are seven sets of twins taking part. There are 60% women taking part, which is obviously a real, um, really important aspect of the sport at the moment. It, it's what makes you unique as a, as, a, as a class or as a story or as an event. And once you have those written out and framed, it is so much easier to write a press release, write an Instagram post, because you're all working towards the same uh, all those messages are working underneath the same framework. So, um, and it's the same kind of thing for a press release. You take that story house, you have those messages that you've decided on, you have your overarching ambition. And the press release then is kind of the, the ultimate of uh, um, the ultimate uh, example of that. And you can think of your press release as an inverted triangle. So it's the most important thing in your headline and your first paragraph leading in down in importance as you go down the page. So that, for example, if a sub editor comes along and goes, right, I only want the first hundred words, they're going to take the top two paragraphs and that's where your most important information is. And the rest of it provides more, um, it provides more color and more interest in the following paragraphs, but they're not as important. So as I said, you've got to uh, write this press release with with the hook. What is what is the most interesting thing that's happening with this? And put it in the headline. Put it in the first paragraph. You can then start to include quotes um, and other elements in the following paragraphs. Keep it to one page, no more than one page. Always, always, always check your facts. Again, as I said, it's, there's nothing more frustrating than not knowing where to go to find out more information, or the phone number in there is wrong or you've got the dates wrong, you know, it's the who, what, why, when, where, all in the all in the press release there. And what I would say is there is a lot more detail on these, um, on how to write a press release on our website. And that's the link there. It's under club development, but we can send that out in, a, in an email later on. And it'll give you examples of writing headlines, what to do, what not to do, um, because it's too detailed here. And because this is all writing, it tends to get very wordy when you're trying to present it so I would suggest that you you go back into that um into that link and have a look on the press release uh uh on the press release article that we have there um I think as well um the just one other thing on on press releases um it's as much as we say don't make you know make the journalist's life easier Try not to write a headline for them. Um, 
something that is, you know, we have an example here in the toolkit where we say sailors in regatta and Kerry were yesterday involved in a dramatic RNLI rescue when a pod of dolphins upturned their boat. You were essentially writing it for them. I wouldn't suggest that you go as far as to do that. Um, you need to give them some space for creativity and making it different to the uh, the radio station versus the newspaper. But it's um, it's 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 uh, it's still about making their life easy and creating that hook um, for them so that they understand why it is that they're being asked to cover your story. Okay. I think we've covered press releases now. I'm conscious that um, there's a question. Sorry, Tracy. Yeah. It, um, is on press releases. Do you find details or stories help journalists write about the class or event? So is it the the details of the event or stories about the people? I stories. Think people like to read about people. <clears throat> about people. Okay. Yeah. The yeah. the details are. Um, the other thing I would say as well that. Uh, it's under the facts element is we tend as a sport to use a lot of jargon we've tried moving away from it in the last few years but it's really it's important to put yourself in the thinking in the headspace of a non-sailor and try and explain it and i'm not saying dumbing it down but just make it palatable to a sports fan and so it could be we tend to be we tend to veer on the technical term or the technical aspect of our sport when actually people want to read about people and that's why i say that the regional media can be really supportive of sailing because they like to know about other people in their region who are doing interesting things they might not they might appreciate the beauty of a of a boat you know, any, I, I, I'm not going to pick a class because I'll get into trouble, but, um, but they will be interested in um, somebody who has an interesting story to tell. Maybe they had an unusual path into that particular class, or maybe they have won a whole pile of events. And this is the, the first time that they're entering this particular event, or, you know, they, they like those human interest stories as we call them. So try and veer onto that side of things rather than the more, the more technical, um, details does that answer the question i think so and it's it's true you know if you're reading an article about something or you see something on facebook and and it's like the the rcyc sailor or the, the wexford harbour sailor you go oh i know that person you know yeah. and, uh, straight away you're into it rather than oh here's another picture of a boat you know well that that's what hooks me in um there was another question as well is there an optimum length for a press release or does it depend on event size or national versus local publication that's no good. my press releases are never more than a page long so that's probably 500 words 500 600 words okay Good. And you have to tailor it then depending on whether it's a national paper you're going for or a local publication. No, I don't think you do. Well, actually, no, sorry, that's not true. It depends, which is not much help. Um, yes and no. I think if you were just targeting regional papers, I would absolutely lead with the local the local story, the local person. Um, so, for example, if it happened to be a world in your particular club, and uh, I would lead with that. I would lead the local club hosts a world event or a local event is won by a, um, or a world event is, run, uh, is won by a local sailor. Whereas if it was a national interest, then you're, you can, you have a bit more leeway to lead with a, with a more, um, with a, uh, with a story that has more national appeal. So for example, um, the dolphins. Dolphins and RNLI, something like that. You know, it's it's a it's a as I just referred to in the press release examples. It's a, it's a, of more national appeal. Okay, yep, yeah, that's fair. That's all the questions at the moment. Yes, it's a kind of a yes or no answer, unfortunately. It depends. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, when it comes to us and our sailing, then there are a couple of things that I just wanted to flag with everybody. One is that obviously we have our own social media channels. We have about twenty seven thousand followers in total across all the channels. And so whilst we can't uh, promise that we will share uh, your content because we have our own posts that we do or our own stories. And as Shona referred to earlier, we have a content calendar. We know exactly what we are posting in six months time. We're only able to really post twice a day. So it means the calendar is quite condensed. Um, but if there is big news or if you are tagging us in those posts, we will really try our hardest to, to share as long as they come into our digital uh, strategy. So if they are 
things that tick our values like sustainability, big world events, uh, the promotion of women in sailing, we will really try our hardest to um, to to share and, and um, create the conversation around your particular event and your class. We also have the weekly newsletter that goes out to about ten and a half thousand subscribers once a week. Again, it's if we have the space, we will try and get things in. But what I would say is they have to be of national interest. So this is back to that regional national question. It has to have your particular event has to have a, a much wider national interest. And then we will see if we can get into the, the, the newsletter. One of the things that we know, which has really worked in the past, is if you have a European or world event and you have an interview with your lead organizer, that can be really interesting. Because again, people like to read about humans, humans reading about humans, that kind of sailing um, human interest story. Um, so we'll we'll see if we can we can put interviews like that in our newsletter. And then the other thing that I would say is uh, Shona and I can always act as a sounding board. If you think you have a really interesting story and you want to kind of get a sense check or a, a a thought partner on it we're more than happy to to help there um yes yeah just in terms of the the content that we have if you are sending us stuff and you think it's it's of national uh newsworthiness as i said keep it to a page long keep it 500 words try and follow those press uh, release rules that i was talking about having that kind of inverted um, pyramid in your head and um make sure that it's accompanied with pictures because so often we get uh, news articles that we just can't use or put on social media because we just don't have any pictures to use it with them as well. So if I was thinking about the three things that I would do tomorrow morning, three takeaways from this presentation, they would be the following. One, do your social and digital media audit. Find out what channels you already have, what's working, what's not, what you think you can dump and what you think you can keep um, and how you're going to match your audience with your message, with your channel. Um, the second thing I would say is start talking to the journalists now so that you can start building up those relationships and try and get them, you know, penciled in for your event and think about building that story house. Think about sitting down with your, uh, a group of people and brainstorming what cool things make your class unique and, th and then everything we should be able to flow from that story house. And that is it for the moment. Any other questions?